I'd like to thank again the organizers for putting on such a great conference in a great location. I'm looking forward to being back here again in the future. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to give a somewhat unusual talk today. Um, there's not actually that much new mathematics that I want to tell you about. Mostly I want to show you a computer program that I wrote that I'm really excited about <laughs> that does something pretty cool. Um, so it's actually maybe a little bit dangerous to talk about uh, this machine, the modular data machine today, because the, the point of this machine is that it, uh, it automates uh, an argument that Terry Gannon and I made in a recent paper in which we uh, computed the modular data, the s and matrices, for the, the center of this uh, exotic looking extended Hargrove fusion category. So the reason why giving this talk is a little bit dangerous is that one of the things that Terry and I probably should do this week is work, on, work out where on earth to submit that paper. It's on the archive. We haven't submitted it anywhere. And it seems rather likely that someone here in the room will be the referee for it. And I'm a little <laughs> bit worried <laughs> that you're going to realize that most of the paper is now obsolete because the computer just does it all in one step. Uh, OK. So nevertheless, um, uh, I'll show you. Uh, OK. So what, is, what does the modular data machine do? Well, it takes as input. Uh, merely the fusion ring of some fusion category C. Okay, C here is, is fusion, and the only input is just the fusion multiplicities of tensoring the symbols together and decomposing the symbols, none of the other data. And it uh, does some Dr. Seussian stuff in the middle, and out of the end come the S and T matrices, possibly several different possible S and T matrices, but some finite set of S and T matrices uh, for the center of a putative fusion category with that initial fusion ring. And possibly nothing, yeah. So the, there, are, there are two main points of having a machine like this. One, you might occasionally find yourself with a very interesting and strange fusion category that you don't understand. For example, the extended Hargrove fusion categories that were constructed via subfactors and are still uniquely amongst all the fusion categories that we know how to construct, apparently completely unrelated to either finite groups, quantum groups, or quadratic categories. So there's some strange fusion categories out there. We might want to understand them better, and one way we might want to understand them is to see what their centers look like. So this machine can show us a lot about their centers. Another thing that we might want to do is show that some fusion category can't possibly exist. We might suspect that there's a fusion category out there. We know what its fusion ring would be. So we insert the fusion ring into the modular data machine, and it says, no. There's no possible s and matrices for a center for such a fusion category. So that category couldn't have existed in the first place. Okay? So those are the two main things that this machine is for. And I'll show you using it in, in both of those two ways. Uh, yes, I, I, sorry, I should, have, I should have put extra adjectives on the machine here. This is a, the fusion ring for a unitary fusion category. Yeah, we're it's, we could get away without that. The way the, the, the way the machine is written at the moment, we make a few extra assumptions. Yeah. It's, it's not so important for, for two reasons. One would be easy to adapt the machine, and also who cares about the non-unitary examples anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So, non-unitary, that means S matrix non-unitary. The no, no, we're, we're, we're really using, at the moment, it, we use some assumptions about the, the underlying categories uh, being unitary. Definition, yeah. The non-unitary uh, uh, modular tensor category means uh, S matrix is non-unitary. No, 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 no. Okay. So, so let's, uh, before I, sh I'll show you the machine in action in just a second, but just so we know what we're talking about, let me say what the output looks like. So this is the definition of uh, what I mean by modular data or an s and matrix. OK. So this consists of, well, let's be really explicit here, uh, an integer little n, which is the rank of this modular data. This is going to be a number of simple objects. An integer capital N called uh, the conductor, uh, a, uh, a diagonal uh, n by n matrix uh, T, the T matrix, uh, with order exactly n. So T to the n is the identity matrix, and that's the first time that happens. And uh, let's see, an n by n uh, unitary uh, symmetric matrix S uh, with the entries Sij in uh, the cyclotomic field of order capital N. And maybe let's say one more thing, uh, 
a, uh, a permutation matrix, although this is just given to us by, by S, but it would be nice to talk about it sometimes separately. Uh, C, with, uh, which is an involution, C squared is the identity. Okay, well, that's all of the data of modular data, but it has to satisfy a whole lot of conditions, which I haven't left myself enough room to write here, so I'll try and squeeze a little bit. Uh, so, uh, ST cubed. Yeah, I know, I'm really gonna squeeze. Uh, <laughs> ST cubed, ST cubed is, is this permutation matrix C, and that's the same as S squared. And that tells you that uh, S and T give a representation of uh, SL2 uh, uh, Z mod, uh, uh, or Z mod, uh, well, SL2, SL2 <coughs> Z for now. But uh, knowing these facts uh, where the conductor appears, actually it descends to a representation of SL2 Z mod NZ. So this is sort of, this, this representation is part of the, the data. And let me write. Uh, it's actually a representation. Yeah, yeah, here we've just got an honest representation in the setting. And uh, I'll write one more thing here, just that the, uh, the first column of this S matrix, or equivalent the first row since it's symmetric, consists of, uh, of positive uh, real numbers. And as we go, I'll add a few more conditions uh, here. So uh, there's a dot, dot, dot here, which we'll have to talk about in a moment. Okay. So uh, what's the, the point? Well, of course, the theorem, even with the dot, dot, dots there, is that uh, uh, the S and T matrices, which I think have already been defined in various places at this conference, uh, for a unitary modular tensor category, So this is here just, uh, maybe let me say it for explicitness. This is one over some numerical factor, the global dimension, times the value of a Hopflink labeled by the simple objects X and Y. And T is this diagonal matrix whose entries are these scalars. X is some simple object. This, is, this diagram is some endomorphism of X. And so uh, it's some multiple of the identity. We write that number as a diagonal entry of T. And so these give modular data. Um, uh, yeah, well, so, yeah, so, sorry, the, we've, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to, yeah. sorry, okay, okay, good, 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 thank you, yeah, fudge factor here, uh, okay, a fudge factor, and once you fix, once you fix some overall normalization on T, then you, then you can just get an honest representation. Yeah, yeah, this is the only fudge factor you need in, in S. And this is, I mean, this is just you, you, uh, you see some problem in this first equation up to some scalar, and you take a cube root of whatever you see going on there. Okay, so the question that we want to, that we're trying to answer is uh, what are the Drinfeld centers of uh, some of these interesting uh, fusion categories coming from uh, from subfactors. Uh, the Drinfeld centers of the Hagerup fusion categories and the Seder Hagerup Seder Hagerup fusion categories are already pretty much known by other people previously. And the, the new thing that we're bringing to the table is is, is information about the Drinfeld center of extended Hagerup. Uh, and the easier question, which I'll answer today for you, uh, is well, we won't describe the whole Drinfeld center as a modular tensor category, but what about uh, just the modular data. Okay. And that's where this machine comes in. So let's have a look at the machine. So uh, all that you need to do is uh, download a current copy of the Fusion Atlas, which you can find online on Bitbucket, and uh, load the Fusion Atlas, and it says, okay, loading. And then, uh, let's see, uh, We've got to go and find uh, an example of something to run this on. So let's maybe uh, look at uh, Emily's homepage. Uh, I want the one at, uh, which one do I want? Uh, this one, okay, her current one. And down the bottom, she's got this great little note 
uh, from 10 years ago, where uh, she writes down explicitly for us the fusion ring of, uh, of one of the, the fusion categories coming from Hagerup. Okay, so let's just write that down briefly so we can use it. So let's see, what I want to do here is I've got this little, these four objects here, one, B, C, and D. Okay, they form the objects, the simple objects of some fusion category. And this is the tensor product rules. I'm just going to write down a little piece of this. I'm going to write down the matrix that encodes multiplication by B. Okay, so what's the fusion matrix for B? Well, if I multiply the identity by B, I just get B itself, obviously. So there I'm going to write down 0, 1, 0, 0. So that's saying when I multiply 1 by B, I get 0 lots of 1, 1 lot of B, 0 lots of C, and 0 lots of D. Okay? Then I work out B squared, and I get exactly one copy of everything. So the second row here is 1, 1, 1, 1. When I multiply B by C, I just get B plus D. So I write down uh, 0, 1, 0, 1. And finally, B times D is B plus C plus 2D. So I get a 0, uh, 1, 1, 2. Okay, so this is just one of the matrices that encodes the, the fusion ring of this fusion category. Let's try that. So I want to type in find modular data, open brackets. Uh, let me give myself a little thing for, uh, how do I, there we go, a little matrix. Okay, it's going to be a four by four matrix and now I just need to type in these numbers. Oh, I've missed one. Great. Okay, thank you. I'll go back and fix that. That looks good. Okay, let's uh, see what it says. So we'll uh, leave it sitting there, running for a moment. Oh, okay, so it's already got started. It's already worked out just from this little fusion matrix it enter we entered. It's gone and recomputed what the rest of the fusion ring looks like, all, all of the tensor product multiplicities. Uh, and it's drawn some graphs here showing us... Uh, well, telling us the dimensions of all the simple objects and some graphs showing us uh, the principal graphs, essentially, of, the, of, the, of B, C, and D in this little category. Don't worry about the other graphs. And it says, OK, I'm off be beginning calculation of modular data. And it's drawn some funny matrix here, which we're going to think about. It said, I'm considering conductors 39. So somehow it's already worked out that we only need to think about big N equals 39. It says, I'm looking for T matrices. Uh, I'm allocating T eigenvalues to Galois orbit clumps, whatever that is. Uh, it's running GAP and uh, summoning some character tables from out of GAP. Uh, it does that, some more character tables for some other group. Uh, it's, it's looking up conjugacy classes of group elements in GAP. Found six ways to allocate T eigenvalues. Found candidate T matrices, checking for Benius Schur indicators. Found good for Benius Schur indicators. Preparing to solve linear equations for the change of basis matrix. Talking to GAP a bit more to get something. It's still working, actually. It's still going. OK, so we'll leave it there for a moment. And hopefully it'll finish in just a second. And while it's finishing, let me, oh, done. OK, OK. <laughs> Stuff happened. Uh, oh, oh, big matrices appearing. <laughs> Lots of output that's, uh, these, are, these are sort of numbers in some exact number field, but hopefully down the bottom here. We'll get to see, oh, it's not quite done yet. Okay, hang on a little bit more. Yep, still going. Okay, uh, let me show you on this board here while it finishes that off, the schematics now for this, this machine. <coughs> okay, so as advertised, you insert into the, the machine at the top left here, uh, just the fusion ring of some fusion category that you're interested in. OK. Then uh, we next work out uh, the possible induction matrices, uh, mm -hmm. showing us how C could uh, be related to its center. I'll, I'll come back and talk about all of these steps. Uh, we then compute uh, uh, dim yi for yi in the center. And then uh, we work out possible conductors, capital N. <coughs> it should have finished by now. Let me, uh, I'm zoomed in so far that it fits on this tiny screen. I can't quite tell what's happening. 
Well, it says it's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn down the magnification so I can actually see the output. Oh, of course, because it, it, uh, it just gave us it in, an, in a number field. So let's, um, it'll save its answers. Um, so let's see. Let me just uh, give you some uh, Mathematica gibberish to typeset it better. So that will say, if you see any matrices, write them as matrices, and uh, then just show us numeric things. It saves its answers, so it should be fast this time around. Oh, there we go. OK. Um, oh, that wasn't quite right. But you can see, oh, no, let me do that again and get the syntax right. Uh, what did I do? Oh, wrong, wrong symbol there. OK, and here we go. At the bottom here, we've got some giant matrix full of, uh, full of real numbers that are the actual entries of the S matrix. And if we scroll over a little bit to the side here, there's some list of real numbers, which are the diagonal entries of the T matrix. Or maybe they're logs divided by 2 pi i or something like that. OK, so it spat out S and T matrices. OK. Yeah, yeah, there are some thirds and things like that. Yep, exactly. OK. <laughs> OK, so let's keep on going here. Uh, the next thing we do is compute uh, the possible uh, representation types uh, for uh, SL2 uh, Z mod NZ. And that gives us some other S and T matrices, which you'll call S prime and T prime, which are just in some stupid basis for some, for some particular abstract representation type. Uh, then we work out the possible T matrices. Then we work out all of the possible Galois actions. Uh, then we work out uh, the change of basis from the basis in some idiotic basis that for the abstract representation type to the basis of simple objects. Uh, and I'll just write here, maybe, uh, we, we're not quite done here, but we, we work out what this change of basis matrix must to be uh, up to solving some linear conditions. And then as a final step, uh, we have, uh, we, we produce the actual modular data. Uh, for, uh, for whatever the center of this category is. OK. Now, uh, just to give you an indication of what's going on here, uh, every arrow here, except these two, I guess, every other arrow in this little schematic is potentially difficult in the sense that, for one, I had to write long and complicated programs that did clever things to make them run in reasonable time on any of the examples. And we have examples, essentially, for each one of these arrows where life is difficult and it runs slowly and, and we don't get answers out of the end. Okay, so there are, lots of, there are lots, of, um, lots of places where things can go wrong and life can be difficult. Okay. So what is the induction matrix? Okay, yeah, I'm, the, the rest of the time is essentially going to be telling you a little bit about these boxes sure. and showing you the computer running one more example. Oh, uh, sorry? Oh. oh, yeah, but I mean, we've known how to do that for a decade now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the fusion atlas has had, had, had that first step, take a single matrix from the fusion ring and produce the fusion ring. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotten better. It's always been good enough. It's always been good enough, yeah, for this, for this sort of stuff. That, that, that technology has been good for 10 years now. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, this, is, this, this function find modular data that we ran uh, takes many different sorts of inputs. You can give it the actual whole fusion ring explicitly. You can give it a single matrix. You can give it a, a pair of subfactor principal graphs, all sorts of things, and it'll, it'll start where it needs to start. OK. Uh, uh, when you just input this uh, fusion matrix, a single fusion matrix, yeah. I, I assume there is already an ordering on the, uh, on the simple object. Sure, yeah. But then uh, how does the system know uh, which object of multiplication does this matrix? Ah, yeah, it always assumes that you're entering the, if you enter a single matrix, you have to enter the second object in that ordering. Oh, the yeah. second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have to put your favorite object first after the tensor identity. If I set the first one, if the program will come, you have stupid? Uh, <laughs> no, you'll just get weird error messages that uh, aren't very helpful. Uh, okay.
yeah, I, I mean, this program is only sort of minutes old being able to operate without, without spitting error messages. So <laughs> you do what it doesn't expect and uh, things go horribly wrong. Okay, so uh, what is this induction matrix in the first step? Okay, well, uh, there are adjoint functors uh, which I'll write I taking us from uh, a fusion category C up to its Greenfield center Z of C and R going back the other way, uh, this one is easy to understand, okay? It's just taking a, an object of the Drinfeld center and looking at the underlying object for getting the half braiding data. Uh, and there's an adjoint functor that goes back up the other way. Okay. Uh, I guess this map down is actually a tensor functor, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. So we've got these functors. And uh, if you look at the level of the Grotendieck group, well, these are functors between semi-simple categories. This just gives a pair of matrices, which I'll write as, uh, well, and, and because the functors are adjoints, these matrices are transposed to each other. And so I'm gonna write the matrix A, for the thing that tells you how to take a simple in the center and write it as a direct sum of simples downstairs. Okay, so this is just non-negative integer matrices. Now, the first fact we need to know is that if you take the restriction of the induction of some object x downstairs, uh, this is just given by the sum over v, an irreducible downstairs, of v tensor x tensor v dual. Okay? So this is the only point at which we use the fusion ring. Well, m one of the only points we use the fusion ring. This is saying that, uh, well, of course, at the level of the Grotendieck ring, R composed with I is just A transpose A. This tells you the fusion ring uh, determines uh, the matrix AA transpose. Because if we know the fusion ring, we know how to calculate all of these guys in the, in the basis of simples. And that, of course, is some symmetric non-negative integer matrix. Okay. Well, an, a very easy lemma is that uh, there are finitely many such A. If you know some fixed symmetric integer matrix, there are only finitely many ways of writing it as AA transpose. Uh, but we can do, but it turns out that merely there being finitely many answers, answers is not actually that helpful. So we need the following two extra facts. First of all, uh, observe that if we know a matrix A, we can compute all of the dimensions of the objects in the center. So the dimension of an object y in z of c is, of course, just because uh, this functor down here preserves the dimensions of objects. This is just the sum over x downstairs of the xy entry of the, of the induction matrix times the dimension of x down in c. Okay? So for each particular a, we know the dimensions of all the objects upstairs. And then two facts. Well, first of all, the dimension of any object in the center divides as an algebraic integer uh, the dimension of the center as a category. And further, uh, the dimension of any object in the center uh, is what's called uh, an ostrich D number, which I'm not going to go into. You can go read Ostrich's paper about this. Uh, but it's some kind of strange numerical condition on the, uh, on the minimal polynomial of, of dim y. Okay. So instead of looking at all possible A's that satisfy this, we can build them up one column at a time. Each column of A tells you about one object in the center, and we can make sure that we only use columns that satisfy these conditions here. Okay? You know this number ahead of time because it's the square of the dimension of the category you started with. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you can build up column at a time until you get to AA transpose, and uh, it turns out that using these two facts, this lemma actually becomes effective in many interesting examples. You can compute all possible fusion, uh, all possible induction matrices satisfying those conditions. There are a few extra tricks we use, um, but that are, are not essential. They, they just to speed things up, I think. Okay. So, uh, um, I sort of wanted to leave this one up, but with using the computer, I have limited board space. Uh, there's not really room to pull it out. 
No, I'm going to come back to the computer. It's a bit of a problem. Um, I'm just going to erase this again, OK? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll see how this goes. If, if, you, if someone is upset about me erasing this board over and over again, let me know. The, uh, the notes which contain everything I write on the board are on my web page, tqft.net slash talks. Uh, OK. So now let's look at conductors. OK. So uh, if this conductor n uh, is a product of prime powers, pi to the ni, uh, we must have, remember the order of the T matrix is meant to be exactly n, so we must have a, uh, an object xi with T eigenvalue lambda i and uh, the nth uh, prime power in our factorization dividing the order of that lambda i. Okay, this is just the condition that says the order is exactly is exactly n. Now, unfortunately, since I ran out of space, uh, telling you about modular data, let me add a few more conditions here now. So modular data uh, continued. So uh, what haven't haven't I written down? Okay. So these are conditions which I'm just going to think of as being conditions on the modular data. In fact, everything I write down now is automatic by various theorems of um, Coast, Bante, Gannon, and sub and supersets of those guys. OK. Uh, so if I look at uh, this representation of SL2Z, which I'll call rho, and I look at uh, the representation acting on these matrices here, well, I can write this out uh, if I wanted to. Maybe it's not much point. Just the point is that if once we know uh, S and T, we know how to do this. Uh, and this only makes sense for L uh, co-prime to N, so we can even do this. Uh, well, the point is that this is a signed permutation matrix. Which I'm going to call uh, GL. And so we have access to both the permutation and the signs let me say that GL entries XY are, uh, is a sign, epsilon depending on L and X, and then uh, either 0 or 1, and I'm going to write it this way. So X to the L here is the, um, is the, is the notation I'm going to use for this permutation. Okay? It's the permutation corresponding to the number L acting on the object X. Okay? So this is some other, some other simple object. OK, now once we've, we've got these nice signed permutation matrices, we have the following two amazing facts about them. First of all, uh, if I look at the T matrix, for the image of x under the, under the Galois element L, this is just uh, T x x raised to the L squared. And then the other thing is that if I look at the Galois action, so sigma lambda, means uh, the Galois automorphism corresponding to re replacing nth roots with their lth powers of SXY is, let's see, some sine that came from that permutation matrix times uh, some other entry of the, of the S matrix. So this is just saying that this signed permutation we get from the representation here um, uh, is sort of, well, is intertwined with the, uh, with the Galois action on the actual entries of the S matrix. OK. So okay, I needed those facts before I finished talking about conductors. So we, okay, so we know there's some, some object with a quite large T eigenvalue there. And uh, now this fact that T x to the L x to the L is T x x to the L squared tells us right away the Galois orbit of xi, this object we chose, and by Galois orbit I mean this orbit here, uh, has size a multiple of some crazy number, pi to the ni minus 1 times pi minus 1 divided by 2. And all that this is, 
is just looking at the number of quadratic residues mod this, uh, mod this prime, okay? Uh, we've got to have lots of different T eigenvalues in this orbit because of this formula. So the orbit's got to be quite large. Okay. And so this immediately tells you uh, for a given rank, there are finitely many possible conductors. Because if you have a conductor that's too large in the sense of its prime factorization, you'll have some orbit that's extremely large, and that will exceed the available rank that you're, that you're considering at the moment. Okay? So uh, we actually do much better if you just use that, uh, that function, well, this, this fact naively. You tend to get far too many conductors that you have to deal with. Uh, but the further fact we use then is just a little bit more about this, uh, this Galois action, which I <laughs> just erased very hopefully. Uh, so if you look at, um, <coughs> well, the first column of the S matrix, or I guess that's the first row, well, this is just a hop link with one entry trivial with a normalization factor. So that's just the dimension of X divided by the global dimension. But then you can look at um, the Galois action of this number And up to some pesky sign, it's got to be uh, the S matrix uh, for some other object. Okay, but of course we can calculate this as well as a dimension. And at this point, we know all of the dimensions. So this strongly constrains where x to the l could have been. It's got to satisfy this formula. And once we know the dimensions, that gives us lots of constraints. And this tells us this. This then gives us uh, upper bounds on the sizes of individual Galois orbits because you can show often that x just couldn't be in the Galois orbit of y for various x's and y's. So it gives you even smaller Galois orbits. And now you've got to fit these numbers within individual Galois orbits, not just within the, the total rank you have. And when you do this, you get, uh, you get a fairly effective method for looking at the possible conductors. So let me uh, try that, show you a little bit more. Uh, so here, I've, uh, I've gone away and looked up in the second line uh, the fusion rule, well, one of the fusion matrices for the extended Hagerup fusion category. It's this guy here. Someone can verify that if they feel like it. And so let's run the first step and ask it, please show us all the possible induction matrices for that fusion ring. And it says very quickly, oh, there's only one possibility. There's a unique answer to solving this A transpose, AA transpose problem. Okay, then we just do something that gives us internal access to, the, to all of the, the package that I've written here. So let's ask it now, well, given that we know that induction matrix, can we please see all the dimensions of the objects in the center? Okay, like as we talked about before, that takes a moment to run. So here it's, what's it saying? The 13 says all of the dimensions in the center live in the 13th cyclotomic field. The second number says, here's the global dimension of the center, actually the global dimension just of the category. And then you'll find there are 22 objects here and we've got all their dimensions. Of course, we have them as exact algebraic numbers. I'm just showing you their approximations. Okay. So then we run this analysis, possible well, Galois orbit clumps, uh, which is basically just this argument that I was talking about here. It's saying that, uh, well, whatever Galois orbit one is in, that orbit has got to be a subset of this guy. So these aren't showing you the Galois orbits, but they're showing you that each Galois orbit sits inside one of these three sets here. Okay? The exact number? Yeah. Of course I know the exact number, but it's not something interesting. <laughs> It's like the second smallest number. Yeah, yeah. The, all the objects in, in this center are very large. It's yeah. Huge, yeah. It's huge. Yeah, the smallest object here has dimension 48 after the, after the tensor identity. Yeah. I'm confused. You said this, uh, oh, this is different than the fusion category. Um, so the fusion ring have uh, 13 objects. No, 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 no. The, the fusion category we started with had six objects, oh, six, six objects. rows and columns. Yeah. Okay. The center we now oh, see has, tw center, well, we're working on computing the center. Yeah, we don't know this. But the fact that there's a unique induction matrix possible here, we count the number of columns here, we see there are 22 columns. And so there must be 22 simple objects in the center of this category. If we've got some category with, with one of its fusion matrices being this guy, then its center must have 22 objects. So center is a Drinfeld center. Drinfeld center, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've computed something about how the Galois orbits look. Sorry, so you're saying the, the Galois orbits are a refinement of this particular the, Exactly. 
1, 6, and 22 is a union of Galois orbits. In fact, it's very easy to do much better than that. And you can see that these guys are a Galois orbit. And this group of 12 is either a single Galois orbit or two of size 6 and so on. But at the moment, we're not even in needing so to the use them. The these are the objects. The objects are numbered 1 through 22. Yeah. And we're looking at the Galois action on the, the numbers 1 through 22. But this is secret. Probably you, should, you probably cannot further refine. Yeah, there's lots of, lots, lots of stuff to work on with the Galois structure. Yep. OK, so let's ask it for possible conductors. And using this analysis we just talked about, it says that the possible conductors are 65, which is, uh, uh, what's that? That's uh, 5 times 13. No, that's, yeah, 5 times 13. And 325, which is 25 times 13. OK, so those are, the, those are the conductors that we're going to have to worry about. OK, let's press on. You always get that. Yeah. Not yeah. Like yeah. And then, yeah. You wouldn't even be able to read it. Yeah. They live in a pretty nasty <laughs> number field. Yeah. Okay. So the next step on our flowchart, so we're now up to here. We've determined the possible conductors and induction matrices we need to think about. We're now going to go away and think about the abstract representation type. Yeah, sorry. If you know the induction matrix, so you'll know the fusion ring of a center. No, absolutely not. We're very far from knowing the fusion ring of the center at this point. The, a curious thing is in this whole analysis, the fusion ring of the center is only going to come out at the last possible moment. Oh. After we've computed the S matrix, we'll use Valinda to recover the fusion ring <laughs> and sanity check that we got no non-negative integers. But we won't have access to the fusion ring of the center I until, see, until after the very end. Yeah, it's sort of alarming. Uh, I mean. One thing to notice is that these induction and restriction functors, the induction up was not a tensor functor, and so you've got no access to the tensor product upstairs until very late in the day. Yeah. Is it induction matrix some like a forgetful function? Uh, uh, that actually you have the center have some kind of a, uh, particles will go to the fusion ring, like go to the boundary, and which particles? Yep, yep. So that, that, was this, that was this restriction functor that we were talking about. Yep, exactly. OK. So, okay, we need to talk about how we, we come up with the representation type. And I'm not going to go into this in enormous detail. Um, essentially, the answer is use a whole lot of gap. Um, so let me just briefly say some of the conditions that we use. Uh, notice that the, actually the, well, yeah, I guess you'll see in a sec. Okay. Well, uh, again, let's have n be written as a product of prime powers. And then, of course, uh, SL2Z mod NZ splits up via the Chinese remainder theorem as a product over these prime powers of these nice groups, uh, SL2Z mod uh, PI to the NI. So. OK. And GAP is quite good at these groups. In all the ranges that we're interested in, it can, can compute the character tables for us. Sometimes with some effort. I mean, in some of the stuff I've done, we've had to like run for a day computing a character table. So this, this can get hard. OK. So um, let's see. Well, once you've got a character table, you can also go and work out uh, which conjugacy class in this group each power of t sits in. And so now you know all of the traces of all of the powers of, of, of t. And that means you know the eigenvalues of t by Newton's identities or something. OK, so we'll write uh, T of rho for the T eigenvalues of some representation rho. OK, and what do we know? Well, we have the following conditions. If we're, the a representation that we're interested in has to satisfy the property that the, the LCM over, uh, kind of, I'll write, Maybe we've got some big representation, which is a direct sum of tensor products of these little guys. Okay, uh, the LCM of the orders of uh, the set of T eigenvalues of that irrep uh, has to be big N, the conductor, because the order of T is meant to be big N. And there are also just some other facts, uh, which I'll write down briefly. But you can look in the paper with with Terry uh, for explanations. Uh, if lambda appears in some irrep in this decomposition, then in fact, 0 and lambda appear together, uh, possibly in some other irrep. 
And this is, this is derived pretty simply from, uh, from the, the facts about modular data. Uh, uh, IREPs of this group have signs, basically depending on whether they take the minus the identity to plus or minus the identity. And uh, you can see by, again, thinking about the dual data of the modular tensor category, the multiplicity of an eigenvalue lambda in the even stuff has to be at least as big as the multiplicity of lambda uh, in all of the odd part of the representation. Uh, uh, I'll just say briefly, uh, we have inequalities on the trace of these Galois elements GL, which we don't know yet, but often by th the limited information we've learned about the Galois orbit so far, we know how many fixed points these permutations might have or might not have and so we get upper and lower bounds on these traces. And then there's a finally a little bit about uh, inductions of, the, of one. The number of uh, times the eigenvalue one appears in the representation we're looking for uh, is, it, is at least the number of simples uh, in the induction applied to the tensor identity of the original category we started with, which of course is just the number of uh, columns which have a non-zero entry in the first row of the induction matrix. Okay, so we have all these extra conditions, and now we just go away and say, okay, assemble all of the representations of this group with a given rank satisfying all these strange conditions. And you get some answers. And so as examples, let's ask it uh, representations for induction matrix. So this is going to give us all the possible representation types for conductor 65 in this particular induction matrix. It'll work for a moment. It's found 346 different representation types that just have the right conductor and the right rank. And hopefully in a moment, it's going to tell us some smaller number that's actually compatible with, there we go. There's some smaller number, just five, that are compatible with uh, the extra information here that comes from the induction matrix, these, these last points here. So what does this output look like? We've got some list here with five different possibilities in it. What does the list look like? Well. And you probably can't see that too well. Let me zoom it in a little. So this line across the top here is showing us what irrep sorry, what not what representation of SL2Z mod 65 we're looking at. What it means is here, take the first representation in the gaps list of representations mod 5, tensored with the 14th representation. Uh, of SL2Z mod 13. Direct sum that with the eighth representation mod 5 and the first representation mod 13, and then, tensor th and then direct sum that with a whole lot of copies of trivial representations. Okay? What does the third entry mean here? The third entry of this. Uh, the third, or oh, the third entry is actually just telling us the dimension oh. of, this, of this irreducible, okay. of this irrep. Yeah. It, we, yeah, it's just useful sometimes to be able to see that. And then the second line here is just showing us as a multiset what the T eigenvalues of those representations were. So this 14-dimensional representation, it's showing you the eigenvalues, the log eigenvalues divided by 2 pi i, so rational numbers between 0 and 1 instead of numbers on the unit circle. So it's saying this 14-dimensional irrep here has two copies, two lots of 0, and then all the primitive 13th roots of unity as, as T eigenvalues. So if we're going to be in this possibility of these five possibilities, our T matrix has to be some permutation of these numbers. We don't know yet which permutation. Okay. Okay, so now it's time to compute uh, the T matrices. So we know uh, T prime, that is the T matrix in this abstract representation, but not, uh, which, not which change of basis brings us to the basis of simples. So we don't yet know how that list of T eigenvalues there matches up with the columns of the induction matrix, which, which of course <laughs> label our symbols in the center. And so this is just some combinatorics, and it's done sort of uh, badly. It, we could do better, but it's, uh, it's already a bit of effort to write the code that does this uh, fast enough in, in real examples. So, um, so the question is just how do uh, the T prime eigenvalues correspond to simples. Okay. And well, what we do 
is we just we enumerate all possible bijections uh, well which are compatible with the limited information about the Galvar action we have so far uh, Remember the two bits of information we know from the Galois group are how, well, how the Galois group acts on entries of the S matrix, so how it acts on dimensions, and then the fact that it raises T eigenvalues to those L squared powers. And we, we want to enumerate these up to permutations of the objects fixing A. So if you look here at this induction matrix that we had for extended Hargrip, uh, you'll see that there are big clumps. Here's a set of four columns with the, that are identical. And here's another set of four columns that are identical. Here's another set of four columns. And out here, there's another set of four columns. So the symmetry group of this matrix, when we're thinking about permuting objects, is at least uh, S4 cubed, which is quite a big symmetry group. So we wouldn't want to enumerate all these bijections and pick out representatives up to the symmetry of the induction matrix. We've got to be clever and enumerate the bijections, satisfying these things, Producing one element of each equivalence class as we go. Yeah. Do you anticipate here the fact that because the row of the induction matrix is a different position, the fact that you have to have zero in matrix space? Yes, yes, we're already we're already using that fact. Yep, yep, yep. We've uh, used that one. <laughs> yeah, if people have suggestions of extra things to stick into the machine, I'd love to hear them. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Or, Later, but it's about the decomposition at the eigenvalue of T matrix. Yep. There's some T spectrum overlapping. If you decompose it into two pieces, yep. the spectrum of T will overlap, at least in one eigenvalue. Yeah, I think we're already using oh, that. Use, uh, okay. Yeah, I think so. This thing that I was talking about, where if you've got a lambda somewhere, you've got a zero and a lambda, is, is, is part of that sort of information. Mm -hmm. OK, we, 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 should, we can talk about details this afterwards. Uh, okay. So, OK, so this is some combinatorics problem where we're enumerating something up to symmetry, producing and a, and, in, and a representative of each uh, equivalence class rather than calculating the equivalence classes after the fact. But you can do that. Okay, there's an important thing that you do along the way, though, that, that, that makes this possible. So let's look at the top left entry. Oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm going to skip lots of steps in the machine in a moment. The top left entry. Yeah, yeah, I'm running out of time. <laughs> the top left entry of the equation uh, STS equals T inverse S T inverse C. Well, let's think the top left entry of this is pretty easy, okay? Because the T matrix is diagonal here. So this is actually just um, a sort of inner product with weights coming from T of the first row, in the, the first, uh, row of S with itself. Uh, so we get the sum over I of DI squared, so that's just the dimension, times TI, that's the, the ith eigenvalue of T, is equal to, and the right-hand side is even better. Okay? C was a permutation matrix, but it actually fixes the identity object all the time. T is diagonal, so the top left entry of S is just, the, is just 1 divided by the global dimension. And so over here, we just get sum over i di squared. OK, so what we do is something a little bit sneaky here. As we're building up this bijection, what are we doing? We're taking eigenvalues and allocating them to individual objects. So at some intermediate step, we've allocated a subset of the eigenvalues, or the first k of our objects have been given eigenvalues. So you can look at this expression here, and you know now the first k terms, but you don't know the rest. You just use the triangle inequality and see that very often, by allocating eigenvalues here, the remaining terms couldn't possibly bring you back to this small number close to, the, close to zero. And so the triangle inequality lets you cut out lots of these, lots of these bijections as you're building them up. And turns out that step uh, is essential. OK. So um, there's now, since I'm running out of time, uh, a sort of secret arrow here that I didn't show you. There's sort of a self arrow here from T matrices back to T matrices, which is uh, uh, checking for being as sure both generalized and higher uh, uh, indicators are, uh, are healthy. They're uh, uh, sure, thank you. Yep, <laughs> uh, uh, healthy. So what do we do? Well, this is a, a trick that was taught to me uh, just recently by uh, Corey Jones and Henry Tucker, uh, that from the data we've got so far, the induction matrices and the T matrices, we can compute 
all of the higher generalized Frobenius Schur indicators. And using that, we can now go and compute the, uh, the actual eigenvalues of all of these rotation operators uh, where you take some box labeled by with some V in the center and some X downstairs and send this using the half grading uh, to this map. Not only do we know the eigenvalue, no, not only do we know the trace of this operator, and the, we know the traces of all powers of this operator, and so we can compute its actual eigenvalues. Those eigenvalues have to have order dividing uh, how many copies of K here times the order of the T matrix of V, and it turns out that's an extremely powerful check, and most of our T matrices get, in many examples, most of our T matrices get thrown out at this point. Let me run a quick example. I'm not sure if I'm an optimist or a pessimist or something else. This is drawn sideways, obviously. <laughs> okay, um, so let's um, see what I was meant to be doing here. Um, I think I'm going to switch to a different notebook. Okay, um, so now, uh, okay. So now, yeah, wh what am I doing here? Um, I want to I'll show you this stuff about uh, Frobenius Schur indicators being really powerful. But in order to do that, uh, we're going to attack a different fusion ring. So what we're going to do is go back to the internet, and uh, we will look up uh, Hannah Larson's paper on fusion categories. And uh, she, a while ago, wrote this wonderful paper, almost giving the classification of pseudo-unitary non-self-dual fusion categories of rank 4. And what does she say, more precisely, the Grotendieck ring must be one of seven rings, six of which have known categorifications. Ooh, this sounds exciting. Okay, <laughs> let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Uh, scroll down a bit and find her main theorem. Uh, okay, in the comment after this, she says, okay, the, everything is one of these things here. Most of them are understood. And it's this case here with C equals two. Uh, I can't highlight. This case here with C equals two that is an open problem. Is there a fusion category with this fusion ring or not? So of course, this is telling us the fusion multiplicity. So we did exactly what we did with the fusion ring from, from, uh, from Emily's note. And we go back and type that into Mathematica, which I've done for you right here. Okay, this was, this was just the numbers pulled out of the multiplicities she just, showed, she just showed us. Okay, so we ask, please find all of the fusion rules compatible with that fusion matrix. Uh, it turns out in this case, there are lots of possible induction matrices, about a, a hundred odd of them. Uh, so let's just look at one of them. One of them. One of them. Okay, it takes a moment. Uh, I'm not sure how long. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, there we go. So there's the 19th of the possibilities it comes up with. We ask it, what are the possible conductors? And it says, oh, some quite high conductors you might possibly have to look at. So five times two to the K, and K can get all the way up to uh, se uh, six. Uh, we can do some of this analysis that we were talking about. So allocate eigenvalues to simples has basically finished this step that I've talked about. It's, it's found all the ways you can pick a T matrix. And so it said, oh, there are four possibilities. Each of these rows is a different T matrix. Okay. But then we can just check that the first Frobenius Schur indicators are healthy. They're, they're all meant to be ones or zeros. Easy to, easy to do. It's very easy. And it says, oh, actually, of these four T matrices, only two of them even have first Frobenius Schur indicators that work. And now we say, well, let's check all of the generalized higher ones and make sure they give you sensible eigenvalues to the rotation operators. And it says, uh-uh, not happening. Okay? So this induction matrix has been killed now. Well, at least in conductor 10. There are other conductors we need to, to go and run. And uh, I had hoped that um, I could run this line at the end, and it would think for a little while. It's thinking and thinking and thinking and trying different induction matrices. Um, and that it was going to spit out at the end of the day the empty list. There are no possible modular data for this guy. My program did that last week, and it didn't do it yesterday when I reran it. Instead, it rebooted my computer, and then it rebooted <laughs> my computer again when I ran it again. Um, so I think we're going to have to hold off on a claim that this category really doesn't exist. I'm pretty confident at this point, uh, but something, is, something a bit funny is going on, and I, I think the machine is, is working in this case. Uh, okay, so uh, there are a few more 
steps to talk about here. I won't talk about Galois actions. We go away and work out exactly how the Galois group is permuting objects. You might complain, indeed Terry has complained, uh, that uh, this step should be coming much earlier. And it's a good point. We're running out of disk space, a disaster. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's probably why it rebooted. Uh, we should work out the full details of the Galois action earlier. My initial at my attempts to do that so far have resulted in programs that run slower, not faster, for reasons I don't quite understand. But there's some, there's some conceptual problem here, and we really should be making more use of Galois action information earlier, which we can't do. Okay, so very quickly then seeing the, something about the last point. Uh, We've, at this stage, um, got uh, explicit, <laughs> yeah, okay, um, yeah, okay, I think that uh, we'll have to give up on the computer at this point. Um, oh, I really, okay, but that means that I don't get to do my main example. Oh, what a disaster. Um, I can't even, can't even cl click on stuff to kill it. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. We won't worry about that. Um, you can see the, the machine is still a bit Dr. Seussian and occasionally, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, but the, the one example that I really did want to show you there is that, um, is that extended hardware up, the one that Terry and I wrote this uh, paper about, um, just runs, spits out a unique S and T matrix and shows you the modular data of extended hardware. Uh, okay, the... The, so the, the last couple of comments I want to make about the final steps. So we know uh, at this point uh, S prime and T prime, S and T matrices for this abstract representation type. And we know exactly our T matrix. Uh, f and what we know is that there's a, uh, there's a change of basis. Uh, say Q. So T prime Q is QT. And S prime Q is QS, but we don't yet know what S is either. Okay. Now, there are lots of linear equations we can solve uh, here. Well, where we think of the, where, that are linear in Q, okay? This is linear in Q because we know everything else. Um, we know that there are two different ways to compute all of the generalized but not higher uh, Frobenius Schur indicators. And that's given by this formula. I'm not sure if people have seen it written in this format, but from the induction matrix in S and T, you can, you can, you can calculate the, the Frobenius Schur indicators two different ways. And very beautifully, even though we don't know S, you can rewrite this as the equation S prime Q T A transpose equals Q T inverse A transpose. We now know everything in this equation except Q, but it's linear in Q, so it's easy to solve. So we go and solve that. And now we automatically get all of our Frobenius Schur indicators correct. And we solve a few more things, for example, that like, if you look at the abstract representation of this Galois element, multiply by Q, you've got to get Q times uh, the actual signed permutation matrix. And at this point, we know everything in this equation except Q. It's again, linear equations in Q. And so you get to the end of the day, you solve lots and lots of equations, but finally, you're not done. And you've still got this equation S prime Q equals QS which is jointly quadratic in the remaining variables of Q we couldn't solve for and the unknown variables in S. Okay? And at this point, we really could just die horribly and be left with a system of quadratics and too many variables that just can't be solved. Okay? It's very sad. I don't really see what to do except to learn more linear equations that might uh, control this change of basis. Um, happily, in the examples that we've cared about so far, these quadratics have been just barely solvable, sort of six to 10 variables and deal with the quadratics. Okay, um, the example I really wanted to show you obviously was running extended Hagerup. Uh, my computer hasn't helped me. Um, the th I'll say, I wanna say two more things about the, the paper uh, with Terry about extended Hagerup. Um, one, I haven't talked at all about the character vector and vector value modular form stuff that's in that paper. Happily, Terry's gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, and secondly, I wanted to say thank you to Terry for teaching me so much stuff about modular data and centers and so on. Um, Everything in here is stuff that I learned from Terry and then taught the computer how to do. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to have learned lots of stuff in this project. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if you can hear me.
up with a teacher, a better teacher. You teach the machine, I'll carry it. So, for the extended hardware, that's what I assume is the quantum dimension 148 something something? Uh, yeah, that was the one we were looking at before, okay. yeah. Do you know if a lot of quantum dimensions are L units? Are units? units? Oh, definitely not. No. So remember when we looked at the Galois orbit structure, there were those three objects at the beginning that might have formed a Galois orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, they were those ones. Their dimensions are, are units, but the rest are, the rest are definitely not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you have a functionality that it, perhaps you know that the category you're inputting is graded, um, that it would make sure that the results sort of filter? No, yeah, I haven't thought at all about adding extra conditions on the initial category. Um, that's a great idea. For, just look for the subcategory. I mean, that yep. would be one quick check, right? Yeah, there. absolutely. There, there are things you could add. I haven't tried that yet, and it would be great to, um, even though there's now a single function, find modular data that is shiny and bright, underneath the hood, it's, it's very Dr. Seussian. So if someone wants to add functionality like that, come and talk to me, and I'll start showing them the plumbing. But uh, you'll need to learn a bit of plumbing to add that sort of stuff. How long is your how long is it? Uh, I could show you. It's on the order of like 10 to 20 pages of Mathematica. It's, it's, it's a somewhat complicated program at this point. There's a, there are a lot of sort of combinatorial steps in here that involve sort of doing enumerations up to symmetries, which are not just sort of off the shelf kind of, kind of things. Yeah? The Galois action of the split hole, is it yeah. done in Mathematica or in GAP? Or? Yeah, at the moment it's done in, uh, in Mathematica. Now, you obviously you should be horrified. Um, the, the, but again, enumerating these Galois actions is not just an off-the-shelf problem uh, because we have the, how to say it? What, so what we're trying to do is just enumerate possible actions of the Galois group on the set of simple objects up to the symmetries of the simple objects given by uh, the induction matrix and the T matrix. So there's some symmetry group that we want to only give representatives of. Plus, there's further information about this homomorphism, which is sort of a, a bit ugly to state, sort of homomorphically, about how, um, how the Galois action acts on the first row of the S matrix. And so far, I haven't been able to think of a way to just use an existing machine for, for enumerating uh, actions on sets. To, uh, it sounds like you, you, you're dubious that, that, that it can't be done, so we'll talk later. <laughs> uh. Any more questions? Thanks to the speaker.